tonight, the Democrats look to the future by drawing on the past. Ours is a fight for the future, and it is a fight for freedom. Unity, hope, and huge crowds as the first black president gives a high-profile endorsement of Kamala Harris. Bracing for an unprecedented work stoppage on Canada's railways. I wouldn't know how I would get down to work, so yeah, it would be a big problem. From commuters to crucial goods, the potential impact. Donald Trump posts a fake endorsement from a pop superstar. No, but she hates Donald Trump. Yeah, exactly. Can anything be done to crack down on AI and deep fakes on the campaign trail? From CBC News, this is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. Well, tonight at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, Kamala Harris's campaign for the presidency was endorsed by a political champion from the party's past, Barack Obama. I am feeling hopeful because this convention has always been pretty good to kids with funny names who believe in a country where anything is possible. Even before tonight, some Democrats had been comparing the surge of hope and enthusiasm around Harris to Obama's transformative 2008 run for the White House. So Katie Simpson is at the DNC tonight. Katie, Obama took the stage this evening delivering a message that is very much part of his political brand, hope and change. Yes, and he really leaned into the idea that in this moment, yes, things have really changed for Democrats in the last month, ever since Joe Biden uh, decided he would not run for re-election with Kamala Harris at the top of the ticket, and that things may feel positive right now and that there's joy and momentum. But he offered a reminder that there is a lot of work to do ahead, that this election is going to be close, offering really a reality check. He firmly rejected the politics of division that he accused Republicans of leading into, saying that people need to offer others grace, listen to people that they don't disagree with in order to make politics less divisive in this country. Donald Trump wants us to think that this country is hopelessly divided between us and them. It is one of the oldest tricks in politics. From a guy who has, let's face it, gotten pretty stale. We do not need four more years of bluster and bumbling and chaos. We have seen that movie before, and we all know that the sequel is usually worse. Barack Obama at times was funny as he took aim at Donald Trump, getting huge laughs from the crowd when he talked about Donald Trump's obsession with crowd sizes, making certain hand gestures as he did it. But Adrian, I must say, the person that stole the show tonight, Barack Obama may have been the headliner, it was his wife, former First Lady Michelle Obama. She also offered a vision of hope and positivity and, and urged Democrats to really build on the momentum here, reminding them that, yes, also, there is a lot of work to do here. This is a close election, but also really ripped into Donald Trump in a way that I don't necessarily think the public has really seen like this before. For years, Donald Trump did everything in his power to try to make people fear us. See, his, his limited, narrow view of the world made him feel threatened by the existence of two hardworking, highly educated, successful people who happen to be black. I want to know, who's going to tell him Who's going to tell him that the job he's currently seeking might just be one of those black jobs? Michelle Obama picking up on an attack Donald Trump had leveled, accusing immigrants of trying to take black jobs, something that he really struggled to define and has been really criticized for heavily. It's part of the contrast that Democrats are trying to create between their vision for America and what Donald Trump is offering. All right. That is Katie Simpson in Chicago. So Kamala Harris addressed the DNC tonight, but from a rally in Milwaukee. And as Paul Hunter shows us, the crowd was large and brimming with energy. Kamala's 
for president. Say it to my face. The crowd began forming mid-morning and just kept growing and growing. Kamala Harris backers to downtown Milwaukee by the thousands, waiting for hours to get inside for just a glimpse of the woman they hope they expect will win the White House. How do you explain this? It, it's, it's like, it, you know, it's overwhelming. I'm so proud to be able to be 19 years old and my first time voting is for um, an Indian American, African American woman. It makes me so proud, and I'm just super excited for where we for where we are headed um, in this country. Later, inside the arena in Milwaukee, her nomination for the White House now formalized back in Chicago. On stage, she walked with a message for the thousands here beamed back to those at the convention in Chicago and across America. We are so honored to be your nominees. This is a people-powered campaign. And together, we will chart a new way forward. It's the kind of message from Harris that has resonated with Democrats, now energized and confident. As a, a battle, you know, a fight ahead of her, but she can do it. She, she will win. As a former Republican lawmaker now puts it, for his fellow Republicans. It's letting these folks know, look, there is permission this time to go vote Democratic. It's all right. It'll feel okay. But the Trump campaign is pushing back hard, again, promoting Trump as strong on public safety, a tactic proven successful in the past. Now trying to stoke fears Harris fails on that front. Every city where the Democrats, led by Kamala Harris, have basically operational control, crime rates are up massively. None of it phasing those who lined up for Harris outside that arena. Confidence here is supercharged. So, Paul, I mean, from here, it's kind of difficult, obviously, to get a true sense of the scale of those crowds in Milwaukee. Can you help us out a bit? Yeah, and they're, they're filtering out now uh, after Kamala Harris. Uh, but for hours all day long, this plaza behind me was packed and there were lineups in every direction. You talk about comparisons to the Barack Obama years. Uh, I would compare it to the, 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 the biggest rallies in, in the Trump years, and I, I went to many of them. Um, it, it's that big. A, a key difference at the Trump rallies, nice people, a lot of them, but there's an underlying feeling of anger that you, it's, it's hard to miss. That's absent here. Uh, everybody that I spoke with talked about the attraction to Kamala Harris is the positivity and the optimism. That, they say, is why they're here today. And that is why the remarkableness of the Kamala Harris phenomenon continues. All right, Paul Hunter in Milwaukee tonight. Our campaign coverage continues later in the hour. We visit a battleground county in the battleground state of Michigan to find out how voters are feeling. Turning now to news here in Canada and a looming major rail strike. It could start as early as Thursday, but already companies are holding shipments. Commuters are making alternate plans. And as Nisha Patel tells us, the sides don't seem to be anywhere close to a deal. The country's two main railways are already taking fewer shipments of hazardous materials and perishable goods like meat and medicine. They're preparing to shut down entirely as contract talks with the Teamsters Union have stalled. We've been trying to get a deal for the last nine months. Unfortunately, the union hasn't been taking this seriously at all. From working conditions to scheduling, all sides seem far apart. CN and Canadian Pacific Kansas City say they're ready to lock out nearly 10,000 workers, while the union insists it's prepared to strike. They are raking in billions of dollars of profits every year. There's no reason why such wildly profitable companies ought to be seeking concessions on uh, safety-related issues. The effects of a shutdown could ripple right across the country, devastating businesses that transport millions of dollars of goods every day. There's so many goods that come into Canada, and rail is part of their journey to get to their final destination. We're just not in any shape to manage a, uh, uh, even a short-term blockade. There could also be disruptions for more than 32,000 rail commuters in Toronto, Vancouver and Montreal. 
we take the train every day and I don't want to drive in on Gardiner for sure. So I guess uh, we'll have to stay home. I wouldn't know how I would get down to work. So yeah, it would be a big problem. Labor experts say there's a chance all sides could still meet in the middle. The deadline of a strike is what provides the pressure that incentivizes the parties to come to an agreement. So far, the federal government has been reluctant to intervene, telling the companies and the union to work things out at the bargaining table. The clock is ticking, though. They have until 12.01 a.m. Eastern Time Thursday to make a deal. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. Some positive economic news today. Canada's inflation rate is slowing. It fell to 2.5% last month. That is a three-year low. This is in line with what most economists were expecting and could lead to another interest rate cut next month. Well, the search continues tonight for six people missing after their yacht sank off the coast of Sicily early yesterday. Italy's Coast Guard is trying to get to the boat's hull where it's believed the missing were trapped. But the deep water is posing a challenge. The boat was carrying 22 people when it suddenly capsized after being hit with an intense storm. 15 people were rescued, among them a one-year-old girl. Today, the body of the yacht's Canadian-born cook was recovered. Well, talks for a ceasefire in Gaza are at a critical point. The U.S. is saying it's doing everything it can to get an agreement in the coming days. But as Chris Reyes shows us, on the ground in Gaza, there are no signs of peace. And a warning, some of the footage in the story is graphic. Israeli airstrikes have hit another school in Gaza City. The IDF again says it was targeting a Hamas command center. Gaza officials say 12 people were killed, while UN officials say the school was being used as a shelter. The horrible reality today where a place that should be safe for families and children sheltering um, has been hit in, a, in an incident, in a strike. Israel has hit at least five other schools in the area this month. The strike comes as U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken races around the region. This needs to get done, and it needs to get done in the days ahead, and we will do everything possible uh, to get it across the finish line. Blinken says Israel has accepted the terms of the deal and now waiting on Hamas. Though one Hamas official says Israel has put too many conditions into the new agreement, including intentions to keep a big military force in the area. As negotiations stall, overnight the IDF recovered the bodies of six hostages in Khan Yunus. 79-year-old Avraham Munder was one of them. You know, the Hamas and the Israeli government both contributing their part to the death of my uncle who was a war hero, who fought in Israel's war. In Tel Aviv, protesters stopped traffic, demanding a deal to bring hostages home, some yelling that every day the war goes on is a death sentence. That rings true, too, in Gaza, the desperation so visible, like at this hospital. Time is of the essence because with every passing day, the well-being and lives of the hostages are in jeopardy. Every single day, women, children, men uh, in Gaza are, are suffering. And a region is frozen in fear of broader escalation. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Ukrainian forces continue to push deeper into Russia's Kursk region, reportedly capturing hundreds of Russian troops over the past two weeks. As Boris Stewart shows us, some of those prisoners of war say they were unprepared to fight back. Ukrainian vehicles still stream towards Russia. For the past two weeks, the military has been battling for Russian territory after launching a surprise attack on the Kursk region. We, we didn't know. We didn't know. But we were feeling something special in this nation. This Ukrainian soldier didn't want to be identified as he didn't have permission to speak to the media. He just returned from Kursk and he said he heard from Russian civilians who were angry at the authorities. They are uh, risking about uh, betrayed from uh, Russian government. Uh, but but the military administration, uh, people don't have communication, uh, water. To counter the perception that it's losing in Kursk, 
Russia put out these images, which officials say show a destroyed Ukrainian convoy. A state media host remarked that one of the captured armored personnel carriers, made by the Canadian company Rochelle, will soon bear a Russian flag. Ukraine has released its own videos, too, of Russian soldiers surrendering, some of whom have ended up in prison cells in Ukraine. We're not identifying any of these men. A freelancer working for CBC News was granted access to this prison. Some of the men are conscripts with barely any military experience. They didn't really teach us how to work properly in the trenches, how to fight, said a 19-year-old. When the Ukrainian troops arrived, he said his group started shouting, there are conscripts here, don't shoot, we surrender. A few of the men in these cells were injured. Their freedom now hinges on a potential exchange with the Ukrainian soldiers now imprisoned in Russia. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Quebec has announced a six-month freeze on some temporary foreign workers in Montreal. In the last two years, we, uh, we've seen an increase of 300,000 temporary immigrants. So, of course, it, ha it has a major impact on services. Like the Premier says the move is necessary to relieve pressure on public services like housing and to protect the French language. The freeze applies to new applications and renewals for workers in low-wage jobs. The changes won't apply to certain fields like health, education or construction. Well, Ontario is banning supervised drug consumption sites that are close to schools and child care centres. Ten facilities across the province will have to shut down. And as Mike Crawley explains, the province is putting money into treatment centres instead. This was taken in 2017, maybe a year before he passed away. Marie McKenna thinks of her son Corey every day but especially on August 20th. Today would have been his 35th birthday. Corey Smigelski died of fentanyl poisoning six years ago, one of the more than 40,000 Canadian victims of the opioid crisis. For four years, he tried and tried and tried to get clean from this very, very toxic drug. Now a major change in how Ontario deals with the toxic drug crisis, the province banning all supervised consumption sites within 200 metres of schools and childcare centres. The cycle of addiction is not being broken by using drug consumption sites. There are 17 of these sites across Ontario where users can get their drugs tested for toxins and get emergency care in case of an overdose. Ten will now be shut down. The province ordered a review of all the sites after Toronto mom Carolina hubner macarat was killed outside one, hit by a stray bullet in what police say was a battle between drug dealers. Not sold on these safe injection sites that are in neighbourhoods, that needles are all flown around. It's a haven for drug dealers, in my opinion. The province is instead promising 19 new addiction treatment hubs with supportive housing. They will not provide safe supply, supervised drug consumption, or needle exchange programs. It's absolutely callous and it's negligent. This community worker says Ontario's move will make drug use more dangerous. We want to make sure that toxic drugs are not killing people. And in this case, we're going to see a lot more death as a result of this scheme. Marie McKenna believes the supervised consumption site could have saved her son. If Corey had had that drug tested that day, he'd be alive today. Instead, his mom marks another birthday without him. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Mississauga, Ontario. Toronto Argonauts quarterback Chad Kelly is back on the field after serving a suspension for gender-based violence. I'm, I'm sorry for my actions. I'm sorry for what I did. The controversy around his return and why the team is standing by him. Plus, a fake Taylor Swift endorsement accepted by Donald Trump. Surely it's illegal. <laughs> like, I, I, no, I, I can't believe that. How artificial intelligence is changing the political landscape. And a lonely donkey has a ball. We're back at two. Well, Toronto Argonauts quarterback Chad Kelly spoke for the first time today after being reinstated by the CFL. He'd been suspended for violating the league's gender-based violence policy. Kelly has a history of troubling behavior, but as Thomas Daigle reports, he insists this time he has learned his lesson. 
Back on the field in Toronto Argonauts gear, number 12, Chad Kelly. The CFL's reigning most outstanding player now apologizing for what he did off the field. I'm, I'm sorry for my actions. I'm sorry for what I did. Um, you know, I affected a lot of people. I come out here owning up to, you know, everything that, that has happened. What exactly he's admitting to, he won't say. But court documents show a former strength and conditioning coach accused Kelly of escalating harassment late last year. She alleged the quarterback even suggested she was fortunate he hadn't physically harmed her. The lawsuit was settled out of court, and now Kelly's been reinstated after a half-season suspension. Chad's sincerely apologizing. He's, he's going through the process of getting better and learning from his mistakes. In college, Kelly was kicked off the football team for bad behavior. Then, amid trespassing allegations in 2018, he was arrested and soon dismissed by the NFL's Denver Broncos. As for the latest allegations, just months ago, he said, I absolutely deny these events. Chad, help us understand. Um, you're saying you're apologizing for what happened, but initially you said nothing happened. So why did you lie in the first place? I, I, I wouldn't say that. I would say that, you know, over the course of, you know, these months, uh, you, you come to realize what actually had been done and, and been affected. Uh, you know, this person obviously uh, deserves all the respect. Signing with Toronto in 2022, he led the team to the Grey Cup his first season. But whether fans will welcome him back now is not clear. Researcher Kim Dubé says all too often, clubs simply look away. The higher the athlete's reputation, the more we tend to put it aside and silence the issue. The Argos will host the Saskatchewan Rough Riders on Thursday, where Kelly is set to make his season debut as starting quarterback. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Donald Trump is sharing a fake endorsement claiming Taylor Swift is backing his ticket. No, but she hates Donald Trump. Yeah, exactly. What Swift could do to punch back and why some say it's not worth it. Plus, a battleground within a battleground state. I'm in the middle of the road. I go this way and I go this way and it all depends on the issue. We'll take you inside a county that could determine the presidency. And a massive cyanide spill triggers fears for the environment and those who live off it. The heart is crying, I guess. It's crying for the land. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. There she is. That's Patti LaBelle there performing tonight at the DNC. The R&B legend sang in memory of notable Democrats who recently passed away. Well, Donald Trump has posted some fake images on social media suggesting Taylor Swift endorsed him, but the singer hasn't publicly supported any candidate. Katie Nicholson looks at the reaction and whether the superstar has any recourse. Outside Taylor Swift's last London concert, giddiness, excitement, and a little shock. No, but she hates Donald Trump. On Sunday, Donald Trump reposted this image that appears to be AI-generated of Taylor Swift as Uncle Sam. I accept, Trump wrote, of the fake endorsement. Surely it's illegal. <laughs> like, I, I, no, I, I can't believe that. There is a patchwork of laws across the U.S. trying to constrain the use of AI-generated material in campaigns. And then there's Tennessee. It has a brand new law specifically to protect artists. One of the laws that uh, uh, could apply here is the Elvis Act. The Elvis Act makes it illegal to use someone's likeness in any AI content without consent. But Swift's team may not decide to take a legal route. Musicians who have been angry about being associated with certain political campaigns in the past, uh, they haven't brought a formal lawsuit. They've just made a big public stink about it. Swift hasn't endorsed anyone yet, but she has had bad blood with Trump. In a 2020 tweet, she accused him of stoking the fires of white supremacy. A candidate would have to be a, a little crazy to think that if they, they put something out there, it would be believed without being shot down pretty quickly. Artists are very careful about who they support, says this professor. The rise of AI means people need to be more skeptical. 
you should question all of it unless you go to the artists, you know, social media pages um, and see if they themselves have posted something. Not that these fans were fooled. I think he's probably seen like all of her fans and seen how many there are and just trying to get them on his side. For now, these Swifties and the pop star herself appear to be shaking it off. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Washington. Now, let's break down the news shaping our world. A mining company forced into receivership by the Yukon government, eager to see the effects of a cyanide spill cleaned up. To destroy the land where my grandfather and I used to hunt. Locals say time is ticking, though the damage may be already done. But first. What are the big issues for you in this election? Definitely women's rights, reproductive rights. The results of U.S. presidential elections usually come down to just a few swing states. And in those states, key counties, even small ones, can have a lot of influence. In Michigan, Saginaw is one of them, a bellwether county that voted for Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden. Ellen Morrow traveled to the battleground within a battleground to find out which way these key voters are leaning. We're in Saginaw County, Michigan, and as surprising as it sounds, with the way U.S. elections work, smaller places like this, swing counties in swing states, can be crucial to deciding who wins U.S. presidential elections. And Saginaw County tends to swing back and forth a lot. It was one of the few places in Michigan Democrats managed to flip in 2020, helping them win the entire state and take back the White House. So both sides are fighting hard for it, with recent visits from Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Now we've come to this battleground within a battleground to find out where these highly sought voters are leaning as November fast approaches. These MAGA voters, you know, God bless you. <laughs> you know, I don't understand you. I don't agree with you. Kamala Harris, I have, I, I just shudder to think if they're our president. There's good, there's bad, and there's worse, and there's way worse. It's a cluster F. <laughs> Can I say that? Saginaw has faced the same economic hardship that's plagued the rest of the American Rust Belt, and its scars are everywhere. A once bustling auto manufacturing industry collapsed decades ago, pushing tens of thousands to leave. Now so much sits abandoned and neglected. People are unsure of their futures. They're unsure of the economy. They're unsure of their job, job security. Welcome, welcome, sir. We gonna get started in a minute. I'm glad y'all came. Furley Coleman is a prominent community leader in the city of Saginaw. A lifelong and proud Democrat, the White House invited him to meet privately with Biden during that March visit. I get a call from the White House and they calling me on my phone. And I'm like, wait, what? Um, is this Hurley Coleman? This is Hurley. Hurley says he described what life is like for the 18% of households here living in poverty. We talked about how the people in the, our community uh, are wanting to trust that their government is going to take care of them. But right now they were unsure because of um, what's happening with our economies. Have you seen support for the Democrats sort of slipping here as a result of the economy? I have. And, and I think it slipped in a place called undecided. Um, and we've had so many people who are leery about the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. They don't know which way they want to go. Saginaw County has often been described as a microcosm of the U.S. Party support here is largely split along geographic lines between the city, home to a majority black population more likely to vote Democrat, and predominantly white and Republican rural farmland. Two Trump signs on this lawn right here. I'm sure we'll see some more of those. But no voting block is a monolith, and at this outdoor concert in this part of the county, we find at least some opinions are still swinging back and forth. 
I'm in the middle of the road, I go this way and I go this way, and it all depends on the issues. Others on both sides are more dug in. What are the big issues for you in this election? Uh, definitely women's rights, reproductive rights. Uh, women's health care. And there has been some concern about whether Kamala Harris would do as well in the Rust Belt as Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about her chances here? I think her chances are pretty good. I do. She has improved herself to me in the last three and a half for almost four years. Our border is terrible. It's terrible. They've had four years to, to prove themselves and they haven't done it. Saginaw's divides are deeply rooted in its history of boom and bust. So downstairs has all of our foundational history. Jennifer Vanette is a historian who works at Saginaw's Castle Museum. You know, they tried different things, but the thing that sticks is the automotive industry. The auto days would change everything here. The city's population boomed, hitting about 100,000 people. We had part of the great migration process of African Americans moving up from the South looking for better conditions. And as more black people moved, more of the European descent um, immigrants who had come a generation before start moving up economically and move out of those spaces. And that begins this segregation process that I think Saginaw still um, is, is facing and looking at today. By the 1970s, we start to see those first indications of deindustrialization that so many industrial towns face during that same period. We're, in a lot of ways, very reflective of all of those larger trends. Saginaw reflects a larger trend of this election, too, that there's a lot of tension. At this popular diner, it's hard to get anyone to talk to us about the election. Uh, I don't want, no, I'm not doing that. But when they do, we hear the same thing over and over. I knew Republicans that are called friends, and vice versa. Uh, and we could talk, we could discuss, we can agree to disagree. But now, you know, it has become so polarizing. It is so us against them. You're either a... Uh... A Democrat or Republican, you're not an American anymore. And that, to me, is so wrong, you know. Why do you think it's become like that? It's the politicians. And here, where people from across the county come to eat, it's obvious just how tight this race is. Trump has a problem, more than one, more than one problem. So I don't know. I don't, I don't agree with with Trump much. I would vote probably to bring Trump back and, and I'm a Republican because of the um, the different things that have happened while he was president. While opinions here are divided, it seems everyone and everything was touched by the downfall of the auto industry. Countless abandoned houses line once lively residential streets. Would there have been a house in this field? Absolutely, there would have been a house there. There would have been a house here. We meet up with Hurley Coleman again to see a neighborhood close to his community center. Yeah, so, you know, when the GM plants all started to close, they couldn't keep their home, they had to let them go. Uh, and many of the homes, they just didn't keep up with them. And we you gotta, see that a bit there. Yeah, this is a good example. You gotta have this example all around the city in different places. Do you feel like people will give Kamala Harris a chance when there are in such a bad economic position? I think if, I think people will give her a chance. They want to believe in somebody who can, who can help them. Is that a spot up there? Yep, it is. But minutes later, just down the street, we meet Duncan McCormick. President Trump, he's a businessman. I believe he's better for our country and making sure we come number one. We are number one. That's my opinion. I'm entitled to it. To win places like Saginaw, both parties will have to appeal to voters who don't have strong opinions yet and convince them to turn out. I'm stuck in the middle again. It's like, come on. <laughs> That's a tough place to be. Uh -huh. Hannah McLean and her friend Ricky Orozco fall in that category. I'm kind of leaning towards more Kamala, but at the same time, I've got to do my research. 
both my parents are Trump supporters and they're like, you better vote for him. And I'm like, okay. now you're sounding like him. <laughs> do you see like this is an important election coming up? I do, 100%. Just with, with the way everything's going, the inflation rates and all that kind of stuff, it's like, you know, it's a big decision. The Rust Belt will be key to whoever wins in November, but voters here know no president can solve all their problems. You know, we talk about Joe Biden coming, um, Donald Trump came, Hillary Clinton wrote about Saginaw in her memoir saying maybe she should have come here more. What's it like living in such an important place? Saginaw County is like a melting pot. It's filled with all types of people, but we all are working class, hardworking citizens who are trying to make this place better. And I think this county represents what America really looks like. Alan, I get the impression it wasn't necessarily very easy to get people to talk. It really wasn't. You know, oftentimes when you go to the U.S., and this is a general statement, but oftentimes when you go to the U.S., it can be pretty easy to get Americans to open up to you, to want to talk to you. That's not what we experienced this time around. Now, obviously in the piece, we did talk to a lot of people, but we were also getting rejected all over the place. And a lot of that came down to, the people told us, that deep polarization you heard in the story. The sense that people just don't want to talk about this, that they've lost things because of this lost friends, lost the ability to have a conversation, uh, struggling with their family members over this. And we heard that from voters on all sides. That was one unifying thing. But what was sad about it was that as much as people are upset, no one sees a way out of that. What was the perception you got of, of Kamala Harris there? Well, you know, we're talking a lot about this momentum Kamala Harris has nationally, of course, DNC week. But when you go to a small place like this, you know, a lot of voters we talk to, people who'd be inclined to vote for her, people who vote Democrat, told us they just don't have a good sense of Kamala Harris yet about what she's about. So that shows you in the shortened campaign the groundwork that Democrats still have to do. So much more work. Exactly. All right, Ella Morrow, thank you. You're welcome. A massive cyanide spill in Yukon has entered the ground, creating uncertainty about the long-term impact. Whatever I'm eating in that area, I'm definitely going to have um, back of my mind. The push for a solution to make sure the land is safe. Slide at a Yukon mine releases cyanide into the surrounding environment. This is a catastrophic failure. Those who know the land call it an unmitigated disaster. My heart is crying, I guess. It's crying for the land. The mining company now in receivership, its board has resigned. And that has local residents waiting anxiously for plans to deal with the toxins. As Julian Green tells us, they fear damage to the land and water has already been done. Ooh. Trekking toward his family's trap Ooh. line along the Stewart River. Steve Bike is after moose, but he's worried about the Eagle Gold Mine, the site of a catastrophic cyanide spill. Whatever I'm eating in that area, I'm definitely going to have um, back of my mind. If the water isn't clean, Bike says, nothing is. My heart is, is um, crying, I guess. It's crying for the land. The heap leach facility was being run by Victoria Golds. When it failed in late June, an estimated 300 million liters of cyanide solution spilled. Now it's in the groundwater and in Haggard Creek. Nearly 100 fish have been found dead in the waterway. Concerns about contamination aren't limited to the mine site. Haggard Creek flows here to the South McQuestan River. Oh, it's the lifeblood of this whole land here. Sylvia Frisch's house overlooks that river valley. Her family lives here year round, harvesting and selling birch syrup. So here's where we've tapped the tree in the past. Frisch's home is the first downstream from the mine. My business is entirely dependent on a functioning ecosystem and the river is a big part of that. I don't believe that they'll be able to clean it up, honestly. Elder Jimmy Johnny is worried his way of life is threatened. To destroy a land where my grandfather and I used to hunt. And, and uh, it's uh, 
very, very disturbing to me. The Yukon's Minister of Mines says, for now, local animals such as moose remain safe to eat. So are fish, except in Haggard Creek. Like, this is a catastrophic failure. We will continue to hustle to, uh, to protect the environment as much as possible uh, uh, from the contaminated water. The Yukon government has appointed a receiver to restore the site and install wells to prevent more cyanide from leaching into the groundwater, water that will eventually empty into the Yukon River. And with the Chinook salmon population in that drainage already plummeting, this northern Toshone chief says there should be a territory-wide ban on heap leaching. People are unsatisfied in the Yukon with heap leaching. It should be banned because it's causing ecocide. Stryker has committed to a formal investigation into what caused the leech pad to fail. All the while, people like Steve Bike wait, hoping for the day when they no longer need to fear using the land and all that it provides. The CEO of that mining operation tells CBC News he was fired this past weekend by the government-appointed receiver. John McConnell's last day at the helm was yesterday. Well, calls are mounting to protect the small strip of land that connects Nova Scotia to New Brunswick. It's under threat from extreme weather and rising sea levels. And as Nicholas Sagan found out, that is sparking fears it could leave a whole province cut off. Does that stop at the water from flowing up here? Farmer Doug Bacon depends on these mounds of grass and dirt we're driving through. They may look natural, but they're man-made dikes, and they're all that's preventing this area from being flooded. But they won't last forever, and if they fail, this land will be underwater. So if that one was to let go, it would devastate us and, and a number of other farmers on that same river. This strip of land, the Chignecto Isthmus, connects Nova Scotia to New Brunswick. Around $35 billion in trade travels across it every year along the Trans-Canada Highway or on rail lines. This area and nearby towns could be completely flooded by the end of the century. But this professor says every storm brings that devastation closer. There are many of us that are, you know, just watching the trajectory, watching the track, watching the tides. And because it could, it... Yes, it could very well happen this year, next year. A recent report found the dikes need major repairs, but raising and reinforcing them or building new ones would take a decade with an estimated cost of $650 million, leaving municipal politicians in the flood zone feeling powerless. All we can do is advocate and push the higher levels of government because that's where the money is. Nova Scotia and New Brunswick are in the middle of a court case pushing for Ottawa to foot the bill. In the meantime, applying for federal funding to cover half the cost. The federal government wouldn't comment on the status of this application. Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities Sean Fraser says more than $300 million in funding is on the line and a decision will come in the next few months. But for people in the area, questions about money won't matter if shovels don't hit the dirt before it's too late. Nicholas Sagan, CBC News, Amherst, Nova Scotia. Up next, a lonely donkey finds an unexpected source of joy. He never had a space in his whole life where he could rip around. How a ball changed his life in our moment. Offering a pose there is Earl, obviously a donkey. He lives at a BC sanctuary on Vancouver Island where until recently, he had no friends to play with. That is, until he discovered his true passion. And tonight, Earl's odd obsession is our moment. Donkeys really need to be with their own kind. We tried to introduce him to other farmed animals, but he just really wasn't bonding with them. When we gave Earl this ball, it was just like, it was so much fun for him because he never had a space in his whole life where he could rip around. So I went down there to do my midday check and I noticed that he had his ball, but his ball was deflated. So I thought, you know, I'll put up a post just to see if I can get a free ball because I'm sure people have a yoga ball just kicking around in their closet they're not using anymore. Everyone is bringing us balls. I had to start turning people away because my garage is full of balls now. He went from being this very isolated, very lonely donkey in a backyard 
to everyone knowing who he is, you know, and the community making sure that he's happy. Was not expecting the uh, reaction from the public that we got, that's for sure. Look at that handsome fella. So apparently uh, they tried goats, doesn't like goats. Uh, they introduced him to a pig, doesn't like pigs. Uh, the good news is not only does he have a lot of balls, but a few new donkeys have shown up, so he genuinely has friends. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenal. Take care.